Now I'm going to hand the mic back to Juan to leave us with some closing remarks. Welcome back, Juan. Today was a phenomenal day. Um, I am filled with a ton of optimism for the future of public goods funding. Um, we have heard from fantastic set of speakers uh, about many different kinds of projects and mechanisms and tools for um, how to do uh, public goods funding. Um, and so I wanted to just kind of um, leave you with a set of ideas uh, for the future and, and um, and then kind of think about uh, a little bit of what, what's next. Uh, so we, we talked about public goods the whole day and we um, talked about many mechanisms for how to um, uh, get more of them to exist and how to reward groups and participants for, um, for creating them. And, and we talked about, um, and so I wanted to kind of touch a little bit on why I think crypto presents an extremely optimistic um, potential for, um, for actually having an impact on public goods funding. So of course, public, uh, public goods have been funded by um, many uh, groups and organizations uh, throughout history, uh, especially governments at, you know, ma with massive um, funding scales. Uh, but it, it looks like uh, crypto networks uh, might actually be able to start reaching the level of funding um, that some nation states uh, have provided. So as a good example uh, for this, it's useful to think about kind of like the, the R&D budgets of, of nation states. And so um, this is roughly kind of like the the, the distribution um, of uh, R&D spending um, across different nations uh, across the world in, in 2020. Uh, you can see also, uh, it, it, there's an amazing graph of this uh, that shows it animated and kind of like, you can see this, this changing over time. And it's, it's a fascinating, uh, really, really useful thing to, to look at. Uh, I'm especially partial to uh, science funding because I think science is one of the um, most important and valuable uh, public funding uh, most important valuable uh, public goods in a sense. Um, and uh, we talked earlier about uh, how the innovation chasm is uh, holding back uh, tons of the science uh, discoveries from having significant impact in the world. Uh, but here's, here's a sense of like the, the funding scale um, that just, you know, one of, one of the bubbles here uh, spends on, uh, you know, non-defense funding. So it's really useful to kind of separate non-defense funding because that defense funding ends up being um, kind of about as big as this whole um, this whole stack. Uh, so a lot of the, the US's uh, focus on um, scientific funding uh, came out of um, you know, sort of afterward, after uh, World War II. And one of the you know, kind of seminal works in kicking, uh, starting all of this uh, was Vannevar Bush's uh, The Endless Frontier. And this was, uh, Vannevar Bush had led one of the um, agencies that had um, overseen the all of the R and D work during uh, the war effort, and so uh, he presented this this kind of um, pitch for the U S. turn now turning uh, towards scientific funding, um, uh, and the, the science has the endless frontier, meaning um, channel all of the energy and efforts uh, that the entire kind of industrial might of the of the U S. Um, during the war uh, had mobilized and now channel all of that towards um, you know, super strong uh, uh, set of discoveries in public funding, uh, sorry, in, in, in uh, basic research and, and doing all kinds of R&D uh, throughout the, the, um, the landscape. And th this uh, pitch uh, ended up turning into um, seeding the, the formation of the NSF and many other agencies um, in, in, in history. And so you can see here in like the graph when the US sort of became um, super committed into uh, to driving kind of a lot of this um, uh, R&D funding. And of, and of course, this, this doesn't look at defense. So defense was actually a very large portion of this because uh, a ton of the R&D was going into defense funding at the time. Uh, but if you look at the, the um, amounts of money, uh, and this is kind of in billions of constant, um, this is in billions of, of $2020, uh, so adjusted for inflation. Um, this, this amount of money is actually within the realm of possibility for um, uh, crypto networks. Uh, uh, in the future. So if we consider crypto networks and their value increasing by just two orders of magnitude or three orders of magnitude, uh, which is sounds like a, a ton, like that, that is a lot, three orders of magnitude is an enormous amount for um, kind of an industry that's in, in the trillions now. Uh, but if we think about kind of all of the forms of value that is transacted through, through assets that could eventually be transacted through crypto, uh, so th things like um, real estate and derivatives and all kinds of other you know, structures like that, uh, then we'll, crypto networks might actually start commanding a level of 
capital um, at, you know, com uh, comparable with, with top nation states. So right now already crypto networks are larger uh, than, than many nation states in terms of uh, economic uh, size. And so eventually um, these crypto networks might actually be able to fund entities and agencies at the scale of nation states. And so, so that's an extremely um, uh, uh, both uh, amazing and, and kind of very promising feat because it means that if we can get the, the mechanisms right now, if we can prototype a lot of these, these uh, structures and we can figure out how to do it well, um, then as crypto networks um, continue uh, uh, rewiring the economy, uh, we can end up with, with a massive amount of um, a funding for, for public goods in, a, in the long term. So a lot of the experiments that, that our communities are running now in, with kind of sizable amounts, but um, objectively small amounts relative to the, to the rest of the world, um, these might actually form the, the, the uh, structures or will inspire the structures that, that might end up um, organizing vast amounts of, of resources uh, to do all kinds of, of um, long-term R&D and um, public goods funding in, in, in a larger scale. So um, if you uh, thought that what you were doing, if you already thought what you were doing was uh, pretty important for, for the, your communities now, um, uh, consider that you might be running a lot of the critical experiments that, we, that we're going to need uh, and we are gonna retroactively thank you for um, in terms of like finally uh, arriving at extremely good structures that we can rely on for, for larger scale funding. One other thought that I want to kind of uh, leave the community with is um, we've talked about kind of the differences between kind of project funding in sort of for-profit endeavors and this kind of um, it's not necessarily nonprofit. It's, it's not for-profit, not, for, not nonprofit. It's rather kind of public goods funding, public goods efforts that are that tend to not be for-profit and tend to not be well rewarded by, by markets. And so I think like what we effectively need to get to, and this is one of the things that the protocol apps is, is gonna be focusing a lot on in, in the coming years, is create a structure that really enables teams to form um, and have a, access to a, a kind of staircase of funding uh, similar to what the startup ecosystem has. So the startup ecosystem has developed an extremely successful staircase of funding to identify really promising businesses. And then um, over time, uh, fund them at different levels once they've pro proven out um, uh, the results. And then eventually kind of have some reward for uh, all of the, so all the prospect, uh, prospective um, uh, speculative investments of, of participants along the way. Um, and so we gotta get to a point where we can have the, a similar kind of ecosystem developing around um, th these kinds of uh, public goods or, or, or network funded uh, structures. And so I think like we can, we can arrive uh, to that with kind of like the, the um, thinking about the, the possibility of like all of the value generation that, that will um, be created by public goods and then use smart contracts to um, you know, vault a lot of that value back uh, into our time uh, to then um, get, get us into, uh, in, into a success case. Um, and so I think you know, this is kind of like um, an, an era of like prior to Zootopia and crypto economics can, can now start taking hold. Um, and, and I think like the, the thing that a lot of people underestimate about the crypto space is that for, for people outside of the crypto space, it sort of feels like a, um, just kind of a new um, uh, important development in, in, in technology and so on, uh, but it doesn't feel that fundamental. And, and what's really going on is that we've coupled the world's most powerful um, superpower machine, the internet, uh, and sort of like computing the software development and deployment platform that we've built with one of the most um, powerful components of, of our societies, which is mechanism design and, and economics and so on. And so we've turned all of that into a, 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 uh, a fully programmable structure. And so that means that the impacts of the, of the crypto space are gonna effectively rewire um, how most of our organizations and economic structures function. And, and the success rate is so, fast and so promising, um, and it's too, extremely difficult to, to kind of um, make a case against it. I, I agree with Talik when, when he said earlier today that um, even now he, uh, he's like dramatically more optimistic this year than, um, than any year before in terms of you know, crypto being here to stay and uh, crypto being um, 
a really strong force for um, economically. And so I think it'll, of course, be rocky along the way. Um, and as these new structures uh, emerge, it'll it'll be kind of many difficult challenges to solve. Things will get built that will not be um, uh, that won't be right, and and we'll have to like go through uh, iterations of of correcting those mistakes and so on. Um, but I think it's an extremely promising um, promising uh, potential. And just to kind of like illustrate the, the power of, of mechanism design in general, uh, I always like using uh, the example of Bitcoin, right? So um, Bitcoin is the output. Um, Bitcoin today is amassing and, and organizing a massive amount of, um, of energy and a massive amount of, uh, of, of computing power effectively, even though it's, it's not very useful computing power. Um, and and the, this like staggering amount of, of energy use uh, is organized just by a few mechanisms thrown into the uh, onto the internet, and so this this is like the 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 just raw power of the of mechanism design, and you know we we've had very direct uh, experience with this as a community. Like we, um, of course, many many blockchain projects exist uh, in the Faco network. We just passed a year, um, and just by weaving a set of mechanisms uh, onto the internet, we managed to. Uh, create a massive storage network, 13 exabytes um, and that's in like one year, which is uh, staggering. I don't think any, um, I don't know for sure, um, because there are many storage networks that are um, uh, not only private, but um, uh, uh, secret uh, by, by several um, nation states and so on. But this seems to be like one of the fastest growing uh, storage networks ever ever assembled. And like that's one of the, um, the uh, just a, a staggering kind of, um, show of like the the capability that you get out of out of creating mechanisms like this. Uh, I'm really interested to see what's going to happen once we finally get um, structures for um, understanding economic flows in all kinds of goods that today um, have been sort of implicit or or um, only factored into the economy and kind of um, uh, end to end or or. Um, where the transactions don't actually quite match uh, what's really happening. Uh, I think today with, with the power of, of, of blockchains and smart contracts and so on, uh, we get the ability to identify all kinds of value flows um, and make them programmable in a way that uh, they weren't before. Uh, so these kinds of things uh, I think are, are um, extremely, um, uh, extremely promising. So as those different kinds of transaction flows can get composed and can get connected and, and interlinked, uh, we might see these kind of massive royalty networks, um, uh, not exactly royalty networks, just value flow networks um, uh, emerge. And so I think this kind of stuff can start very small. I think one of the, the very successful things about the, the blockchain space has been um, the strong emphasis on small composable improvements released out into the network that people then end up building on. So I think something like this could get started just by developing the tools and primitives to create uh, you know, distributions of, of impact. Uh, like, for example, if you could easily go uh, to a website today and um, describe a list of participants and their rough, um, uh, you know, some weight uh, in, in the distribution of credit that they might receive and just create that as a smart contract that just flows value, whatever value goes into it, um, into his account, it just flows out to all of the other accounts um, according to that distribution. And if you make that distribution updatable over time, um, that that component just on its own could start forming all of these networks over time. Um, and so I think right now Mirror can do something close to that. I think they call it a split. Um, but this hasn't really been been done at a larger scale and for for any other kind of components. So I think just that primitive uh, could enable reusing all of the NFT uh, infrastructure to to now couple um, many different kind of um, assets and 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 property and so on with entire networks of value generation, which, which would be extremely, uh, extremely interesting. Uh, and, you know, just as a, an, an example of like the, the scale of, of, um, of value that could flow through these things, like this is, this is just kind of the stats on the, on the NFT art market. This is mostly art, some amount of gaming now, but um, uh, this is, it's pretty staggering to see kind of the, the level of uh, transactions and the level of, of, of funding going through these systems. Um, I would expect this to to keep growing a lot, and especially change a lot once, um, you know, 
physical real estate starts joining, right? So when um, actual property is transacted, um, you know, kind of houses and, and land and so on starts getting transacted in blockchains, so this will grow tremendously. Um, I think uh, we talked a lot about DAOs today. Um, I think that they are, it's been amazing to see the, the rise of DAOs as a, a new organizational primitive um, that many, many groups are exper experimenting with. Um, it's been really great to see kind of the success cases so far. Um, I haven't seen, there's been a, a lot of cases where these, where DAOs have been successful in achieving a lot of things, but I ha we haven't yet seen DAOs that do kind of like robust long-term planning um, and, and uh, you know, kind of achieve like really efficient um, outcomes in terms of um, the time spent and, and so on. Uh, I think that, that'll be a place to watch. I think once um, we should come up with some test cases for what DAOs should be able to achieve um, and at what degree of quality and, and with what sort of resources. That's kind of like a test case or um, for uh, DAO designs to, to evolve towards uh, to get to be extremely successful. I think um, this also presents the, the promise of potentially um, coming up with new organizational primitives for many different kinds of uh, structures that exist today. So for example, it'd be really, really cool to be able to create Kind of a new version of a research lab or or an R and D organization, which is just sort of um, constituted or formed in the blockchain, and all of the participants that keep contributing to its projects and so on get tracked in in um, credit assignment uh, networks uh, across across the history of the of, of the of those projects, uh, and then over time, um, you, you can sort of like uh, either potentially subdivide those labs as those labs grow and kind of like nucleate out into into smaller labs, um, or get kind of like interrelated in some ways. And then you could then apply all this uh, public goods funding kind of structures, especially retroactive public goods funding work um, to then yield a totally different way of um, funding uh, science and funding R&D. Uh, I'm super excited for uh, all of the things that the community is building and that are, are gonna get built. Um, I, I really hope like this uh, today has been um, useful uh, in kind of exploring a lot of these, these structures. Uh, I would love to see kind of certificate impact, uh, certificate of impact markets actually emerge. I think it's one of these ideas that once, once it gets built uh, well and we can have large uh, volumes of transactions around certificates of impact, um, this might turn out to be one of the most important contributions um, in, in, in an entire space. Uh, and so I think th this is one of those ideas kind of like cryptocurrency that once it gets built out and gets uh, uh, tested out at scale and once we work out all of the problems and so on, uh, this could be one of the the most valuable contributions, um, maybe perhaps in a decade. Uh, so I think like this is the stuff that people should be experimenting with and, and building on and, and so on. Finally, I think um, I want to kind of like create a, a hope that I think we could create a crypto powered ARPA level institution um, and you know, create it in kind of a composable way by being able to kind of commission roadmaps uh, publicly, be able to integrate those um, roadmaps into kind of tech trees then commission kind of a, a, a um, scoping of individual uh, experiments that need to be done or uh, project plans for, for kind of achieving those, um, those potential, unlocking those potential technologies and then create uh, funding pools and networks to then sort of in, um, invest into, into the generation of, of new scientific results and the translation of those scientific results into new technology and, and you know, crossing the chasm and so on. Um, and kind of feed all of that back on, on itself. And so I think we might be able to uh, arrive at, um, you know, sort of like the, the world's best um, science and, and tech R&D um, uh, institution, uh, but this won't quite be a single institution. It'll be um, a network of institutions uh, composed through mechanisms uh, publicly. And I think if we can build the right primitives in, in the pieces and test it out with, I don't know, at the scale of like, you know, tens of millions uh, over the next year or so, um, and we find a good model that works, we could potentially scale that out by two or three orders of magnitude over the next five years, five to 10 years. And so that's an extremely promising, um, promising thing because that would start being able to fund all kinds of efforts that today are, are totally underfunded. So I think that this is uh, pretty interesting. So again, thank you for working on this, on this area of, of, the, of the chasm. Let's try and get more groups to cross. Um, uh, I'll plug again the amazing talk from uh, Eric Drexler on Paradisopia and Goal Alignment. Uh, it's one of the, the most 
useful ideas that I think um, our communities can uh, can benefit from. And um, I want to give a special plug to uh, Patreon because I think it's one of these things where perhaps in the future we should uh, ask them to give a talk about this as well. This is one of one area that has been experimenting with public good funding um, in a kind of a pretty decentralized way on uh, this sort of uh, totally outside of the crypto space, but, but extremely interesting. Um, it's really cool to see that all the stats are around it. Um, and, and the last uh, thing I wanted to mention is kind of this idea of funding staircases, which is there's one really useful structure around the investment landscape is the ability to kind of um, very easily um, start projects and test them out and get to the next level of impact and use that experience to kind of raise more funding and so on. In the, the investment landscape in uh, for-profit businesses and so on, uh, it's filled with tons of investors across this entire landscape, um, giving many different levels of funding based on kind of um, really well-established um, impact metrics. And there are uh, tons of organizations doing this. So I think that one of the really useful things is looking at just how much capital gets deployed this way. So it's on the order of you know, now, at least VC. So there's much more in other parts of invest investing, but just VC alone is, is on the order of 300 billion a year uh, nowadays. Um, and, and this is deployed by a very large decentralized network. So we're talking hundreds of thousands of, of angel investors, tens of thousands of VCs, um, and millions of investors in public markets. Um, this is like a, a, a pretty large um, uh, uh, decentralized network of funding. And so it'd be really, really amazing to be able to create a, a similar structure for public funding, where today um, there is a very large amount of funding, but it's mostly, um, it's very decentralized in the small scale. So in the smaller parts of the, of the staircase, it's, it's very decentralized. There's tons of individuals doing donating tons of money. Um, but in the larger scales, it's actually quite small. Um, there are you know, few large uh, large agencies and um, sorry, the, the text uh, here didn't get updated, but uh, there, are, there are a few large agencies and um, tons of the funding ends up being uh, overseen by uh, small groups uh, that fall prone to kind of all kinds of um, groupthink and bad decision-making that, that we know about like, um, uh, you know, happen in, in kind of like large organizations. And so it'd be extremely interesting to see what happens when this entire landscape gets way more decentralized. Uh, so again, um, get involved. I would say um, there's uh, if you're interested in working on any of this kind of stuff, uh, so evaluating impact, impact markets, network OKRs, compostable funding via blockchains, um, reach out to us. Uh, we would be super happy to um, evaluate uh, proposals for funding. Uh, so things like grants and so on, or potentially retroactive funding, um, contact us. Uh, we'd love to kind of, um, we, we'll, we'll apply this kind of in uh, funding staircase approach with different different levels. And um, as Evan mentioned, we are hiring for public funding teams. And you also saw, saw um, the plug for the s process developer from um, uh, from Andrew. Uh, definitely check if you, you know, are interested in any of these, uh, definitely apply. And thank you so much for an amazing day. Uh, thank you for uh, working on this in this area. And I wanted to kind of end with a huge thank you to all the organizers and all the people and all the groups that, that um, were involved. This was a huge labor of, a uh, hu huge amount of effort and, and a ton of labor um, over the last uh, week. Uh, it was a, a, a fantastic day overall. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Carla, for uh, running an amazing show today. Um, I'm super in awe of your uh, amazing ability as a, as a host. So uh, thank you so much. And that's it. Uh, perhaps see you uh, around another time. <laughs>